This video contains spoilers for Baldur's Gate 3. If you haven't seen the first two videos, there's a link in the description. The first step to bringing down a cult is choosing exactly three companions to assist you. Upon reviewing his options, Twilight Eclipse welcomed Sir Fuzzalump back to the party, and told Sinizith that her place was here, in camp, doing nothing. I have encountered few Githyanki in my life. Meeting you and Lazel makes me wish I knew more of your culture. This was convenient because Twilight Eclipse had agreed to destroy the god of Githyanki culture and needed some backup. Did you have anyone particular in mind? Minthara got changed into something less spidery and dyed it pink. It was her first step away from a life of tyranny and towards a life of heroism. Nearby, a metaphor for greed demanded the party hand over all the gold they were carrying. Twilight Eclipse had learned by now that offering people what they asked for tended to end in violence, so he skipped a few steps and attacked. The Toll Collector's armor was impenetrable, but so was Twilight Eclipse's strategy, so it was a fair fight. This whole encounter probably concealed a deeper message about the consequences of hoarding wealth, but Twilight Eclipse had never encountered figurative language before, and if he had, he wouldn't have liked it. He let Minthara keep the Toll Collector's mace because she was new and had missed out on lots of opportunities for collecting loot in the past. Then he wrenched open a large safe and discovered a single piece of gold lying within. Perhaps appearances can be deceiving is a thought that did not occur to him. Down the road, the party were ambushed by shadows. According to official lore, shadows are especially drawn to creatures untainted by evil. Twilight Eclipse was aware of this and interpreted the ambush as a ringing endorsement of his previous decisions. Sir Fuzzalump summoned a cloud of daggers and Lazel pushed someone into it. The old ones are the best, said Twilight Eclipse, about Sir Fuzzalump. After pretending to read a series of plaques, Twilight Eclipse accidentally opened a secret passage. Inside a hidden temple, a trio of statues tested his intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. Twilight Eclipse was relieved that he wasn't being tested on anything difficult, like how to skim a stone or how to survive or prevent a monkey attack. In the next room, he found a bloody altar and a ritual dagger. This was obviously a prize of some kind, so he pocketed it. At the same time, for unrelated reasons, a group of undead knights attacked. The party quickly dispatched their enemies, and then Twilight Eclipse accidentally stood in acid for too long and fainted. After regaining consciousness in camp, Twilight Eclipse gave the ritual dagger to Minthara, because she was new and had missed out on lots of opportunities for collecting loot in the past. Minthara said thank you by talking about how she desperately wanted revenge against the cult she accidentally used to work for. She said she had once been the absolute dagger, which didn't sound right to Twilight Eclipse. While Minthara was quite pointy, daggers were not usually blue. That night, the Dream Guardian returned and started taking credit for how nobody had transformed into a Mind Flayer recently. That's completely irrelevant, said Twilight Eclipse. What a pointless dream this is. The following day, the party got an uneasy feeling when they saw a pair of yellow eyes peering out of the floor. Twilight Eclipse immediately drew his sword, which belted out a copyright-free rendition of Star Spangled Banner. The whole team were overwhelmed with confidence and vigor, except for Fine Familiar, who was banished to the Shadow Realm. Once outside, the party stared stoically into the distance as they considered the shadow curse that surrounded them. Specifically, they considered why that inn over there was protected from it and shrouded with ethereal light. On the way to the inn, Twilight Eclipse was ambushed by a brood of larval clowns who had not yet developed their adult plumage. Thankfully, Twilight Eclipse was not scared of clowns because he had real problems. If anything, he found them pathetic and desperate, like all performers. You there! Step forward! and keep your hands off your weapons. Twilight Eclipse explained that he didn't answer to sentries and demanded to speak to someone more important. Shut up! The sentry led the party to Jahira, who made sure everyone knew she was a druid. Before Twilight Eclipse could finish describing how he would eradicate Jahira's entire bloodline in a single turn, she produced a brain worm which squirmed with excitement as it detected the growing colony behind Twilight Eclipse's eyes. Jahira was about to make the second biggest mistake of her life when a true soul in disguise intervened. Hold on, Jahira. I think I know this one. If you want to survive this, then trust me. One true soul to another. Twilight Eclipse had never seen this man before, so he immediately revealed his secret to Jahira. Then, he told her that she needed to relax because he wasn't even a cultist anymore. When this didn't work, he showed her the astral prism. What in the hell is that thing? Twilight Eclipse had expected Jahira would try and kill him when he showed her the artifact, but instead she offered him food and a place to stay. Come join me for a drink. 
You may just be the godsend we've been praying for. He sensed that this was the beginning of a long and prosperous collaboration, but that was a mistake. The second step to bringing down a cult is shopping. Lazel bought some new armor and dyed it pink, the hue of heroes, and green, the color of skin. Twilight Eclipse bought a cape and dyed it to match Lazel's armor. It was like a cute couple's costume, except nobody was cute and they weren't sufficiently in love to give each other buffs. In the inn, Jahira spiked Twilight Eclipse's wine with truth serum. You perceive a faint hint of cloth grass, a herb that is said to elicit the truth. This was unnecessary, as Twilight Eclipse had never lied and didn't have any secrets. Jahira started lecturing the party about how Ketherick Thorm used to be dead but stopped doing that in order to become everyone's problem. It seems he is no longer mortal. He has become, in fact, in Twilight Eclipse explained that he didn't care whether he could see Thorm or not. He would find him and kill him. Upstairs, Twilight Eclipse explained to the True Soul that he had a magical artifact that resisted the Absolute's influence. Fist Marcus did not take this news well. You're not one of us. You're an abomination. This was quite insulting until Twilight Eclipse discovered that being one of us would mean being a hideous ghoul that killed people with dark magic. He could live with this, which was something else that separated him from the ghouls. After the fight, Jahira and Isabel mistook Minthara for Twilight Eclipse. You're meant to save us all, I believe? You can walk among the cult unnoticed. Meanwhile, Twilight Eclipse was slotting another worm behind his eye, making him even more charming and mysterious. In a nearby room, a man was stubbornly refusing to die. Twilight Eclipse charmingly suggested stamping on the man's head to free up valuable bed space. Please, that isn't helpful. Slightly embarrassed at being called out like this, Twilight Eclipse pretended to care for a minute before concluding that this man's sickness was at best irrelevant and at worst selfish. That night, Lazel crept over to Twilight Eclipse while he was asleep, signifying she was either trying to kiss or kill him. A parasite grips my mind. My own people hunt me. But I am gnawed by an even greater torment. You. She asked Twilight Eclipse to prove his commitment to their relationship via single combat. This is apparently how Githyanki resolve all disputes. Working in customer service on the astral plane is probably exhausting. Lazel began the duel with a critical miss, provoking our hero to charm her by channeling brainworm magic. He then froze her in place with magic, which apparently violated some sort of rule that Lazel had neglected to mention. <laughs> Not Twilight Eclipse generously helped Lazel to her feet and she wandered off without comment. When Twilight Eclipse followed her and asked for a kiss on the cheek, Lazel explained that she didn't enjoy public displays of affection. I won't be guilted into indulging your whims. I have my limits and you will respect them. This rejection would have hurt the average man's feelings, but Twilight Eclipse's mastery over his emotions was absolute. He was also missing a large chunk of his amygdala due to the parasitic worms eating his brain. He channeled any lingering resentment and anger into his work. At a local hospital, Twilight Eclipse pretended to be sick, but was informed that he should have contacted them at 8am if he wanted an appointment. He told them that he'd been busy at 8am and demanded to be seen now. When this didn't work, Lazel took matters into her own hands. Further inside the building, some sort of pirate professor was giving a lesson on vivisection. Let us cure you. The last time someone had offered to cure Twilight Eclipse, a surgical chair had exploded and he'd been forced to slaughter an entire Githyanki crash. He politely declined. In the ensuing scrap, Sir Fuzzalump summoned a stinking cloud that prevented opponents from taking actions. Then, Minthara ran in and used her bonus action to prevent the Doctor from attacking anyone but her. Since they were both in the stinking cloud, it became impossible for him to attack, so he just skipped his turn instead. Just a cute little combo I wanted to share. Felt clever when I did it, moving on. The party reached level 7, and Sir Fuzzalump learned the ability to summon this guy. Twilight Eclipse wondered what Sinizith was up to back at camp. In a nearby morgue, they found an amulet that lets its user summon black tentacles out of the floor. Twilight Eclipse gave this to Lazel, making a mental note to check in with her later for the inevitable reward that would follow his public display of affection. After passing through the morgue, Twilight Eclipse found another cape, which she gave to Lazel. Ever since Twilight Eclipse had started wearing a cape, they'd become incredibly fashionable across Faerun. Imagine if Taylor Swift started wearing Crocs everywhere. It's a bit like that. The capes were so trendy and cool that a nearby school of Kuatoa tried to get their hands on them. Or fins. 
Unfortunately, their fighting style was too inefficient, so they were easily slaughtered. They couldn't deal with the sheer scale of the party's power. Lazelle almost felt guilty about battering so many fish, but Sushi got over it. Back at camp, the hirelings were staring at a wall, as is traditional in their circles. Twilight Eclipse asked Lazelle for a little kiss, and she again rebutted him. Understandably, Twilight Eclipse decided to visit a local bar for some much needed romantic advice. Clank! Go back down, wet your whistle! Tell you a story! You and I both! To our good health! Twilight Eclipse didn't want Lazel to think he'd gone soft, so he downed the suspicious pint in one. This will impress her, he thought, wrongly. Now tell me a story. Twilight Eclipse began to recount his whole life story, but having just finished his first ever pint, this was not as easy as it sounded. I am dirt. You are dirt. Next, he told the bartender the secret routine he underwent every day to preserve his majestic and real mane of blonde hair. Rise of a The ensuing fight was very confusing and nobody knew what was going on and then the bartender spontaneously erupted his insides all over the floor and fell over, exposing himself to everyone in the bar. In British culture, this would generally be considered a good time. The bartender had been taught a lesson about trust and Twilight Eclipse was about to ignore a lesson about moderation. He was brimming with confidence and felt a strong urge to prove himself, ideally via a gauntlet of challenges, preferably underground. The third step to bringing down a cult is triumphing over adversity. After enduring an unsolicited poem from a passing British stranger, Twilight Eclipse told him to stop waffling and get to the point. Listen here, pipsqueak. Do not underestimate this opponent. At best, you will have the blink of an eye to strike. Ignoring the stranger's warning, the party decided to delve too greedily and too deep. After hitting buttons at random, they uncovered a magic disc which lowered them gently down to the gauntlet of Shah. Twilight Eclipse had encountered one of Shah's clerics before and assumed her trials would be just as easy to defeat. While he was no stranger to minor setbacks, even when facing impossible odds, Twilight Eclipse was getting a headache, so he turned off the lights and discovered the Shah worshippers had stupidly written a solution to the first trial on the floor. In the next room, some skeletons had forgotten that they were dead and tried to boss the party around. You upset my plans. Leave. You have awoken the shadows. Rally on me. A wall of bone and blade against the darkness. Twilight Eclipse was not in the habit of taking orders from failures, so he didn't offer any help. Then, the party easily wiped the floor with Shah's pathetic excuse for followers. Twilight Eclipse took a quick breather on a bench until the wall stopped spinning and the party continued on their quest. Further into the temple, they found an Orthon whose freedom had been stolen away by a musical contract. Spill or the blood swan to the night. Silence or prayers smother each right. Twilight Eclipse explained that the song was terrible and told the devil to kill his followers so they wouldn't have to hear it anymore. This ends now. The fight against the Orthon and his horde was simple and largely uneventful except for Sir Fuzzalump burning to death. Twilight Eclipse brought the Orthon down by making its brain explode and then the party spent a moment paying their respects by Sir Fuzzalump's charred remains. Then, they remembered they could revive him, so they did. This vessel is at thy disposal. Do what thou wilt. He seemed fine. In the next room, Twilight Eclipse found a spider carcass and decided to give it a lick. The meat tastes of rot and sour milk. Your stomach lurches, but your loins tingle. There was something subtle, almost evasive, hiding in the meat's taste profile. Twilight Eclipse decided to get to the bottom of it. It turned out that the secret ingredient was poison and Twilight Eclipse promptly fainted. This is pretty much how I would feel if I drank a whole glass of milk. Although Twilight Eclipse had recovered from the poison, he was still very drunk, so decided it was time to get some rest. That evening, Twilight Eclipse had a heart to heart with Sir Fuzzalump. I'm sorry for letting you get burned and exploded to death, he said. That was a mistake. Then he asked Sir Fuzzalump if he would like to buy some merch, which somewhat undermined the apology. The following day, a necromancer had the audacity to question Twilight Eclipse's hairline. Though it's not all natural, is it? For the land of the free. 
Further into the temple, they found an altar that required a blood sacrifice. Twilight Eclipse explained that his skin was too thick and calloused to be penetrated, and ordered Sir Fuzzlelump to take one for the team. This was quite brave of Sir Fuzzlelump, because wizards have about six hit points, and some of those are just for show. Twilight Eclipse changed into his pyjamas and effortlessly evaded Shah's sentries. He unlocked the final gate and completed the trial without any trouble at all. He viewed stealth as a boring waste of time and hoped the next trial would provide a suitable challenge. Fortunately, he was not disappointed. Four powerful enemies laid in wait in the next chamber. Evil Twilight Eclipse, Evil Lazel, Evil Sir Fuzzlelump, and Minthara. Lazel quickly cut down two opponents, then Twilight Eclipse used a Mind Flayer version of Counterspell to disintegrate Evil Sir Fuzzlelump. He then wrapped up the encounter by shooting himself in the head. Lazel confessed that she found this latest victory to be profoundly alluring. Soon, I would know you again. Not to claw you, but to caress you. Not to be burned in your heat, but to be bathed in your warmth. Seeing this softer side to her was a bit of an ick. The next trial was a simple task that was almost impossible to fail. The next trial was designed to be impossible, but Twilight Eclipse was an impossibly gifted hero who expertly navigated the invisible platforms and retrieved the orb. After battling through a library, they encountered a puzzle that required reading. Twilight Eclipse often described reading as structured daydreaming and felt it was beneath him and a waste of time. He got Sir Fuzzlelump to tell him which book was the right one to use. Behind a hidden door, Twilight Eclipse found several pieces of shah themed merch, which would have probably excited a lesser cleric. Twilight Eclipse didn't need a spear, he had a singing sword. The party arrived at the final barrier in their path and realised they were missing an orb. They then spent 30 minutes of real time searching around to try and figure out which orb they'd forgotten to pick up. Eventually, they realised that because Twilight Eclipse hadn't offered his own blood at one of the trials, the orb had not been added to his inventory when he grabbed it. This seemed somewhat arbitrary to Twilight Eclipse, who made a mental note to complain about it to as many people as possible. Twilight Eclipse told Sir Fuzzlelump that he should never have interfered by offering his own pathetic blood. He put the wizard on a performance improvement plan for the foreseeable future. Wading into mysterious water, Twilight Eclipse was flushed away to the Shadowfell. When he woke up, he wondered whether this was a suitable reward for collecting all those orbs. Frankly, the whole situation felt like a downgrade. There was a mysterious woman shackled nearby who was apparently the source of Catherick Thorm's invulnerability. The Spear of Night could be meant to sacrifice the Night Song. But are you the one supposed to wield it? Twilight Eclipse ignored the other narrator's negativity and had a go with the spear. This was the second time Twilight Eclipse had stabbed a mysterious woman in a strange place full of floating rocks. It didn't work last time, and it didn't work now. He couldn't find a way to leave the Shadowfell without freeing Aelin, so he pretended that that had been his plan the whole time. He also explained that stabbing her with a spear had been a joke. If she didn't find it funny, that was her fault for not understanding dark humour. The fourth step to bringing down a cult is annihilating its leader. Now that Ketherick Thorm was no longer... The party rushed to Moonrise Towers. This is it. The spearhead moment. You brought us this far. So how shall we proceed? Twilight Eclipse told Jahira to trust him and follow his lead. He had something special planned that would bring Ketherick's forces to their knees. Before the fighting began, Disciples Rel had time to squeeze in a quick monologue. You have betrayed me. You have betrayed General Thorm. You have betrayed our God. And in death, you will all serve the Absolute. I will never serve the Absolute again. And I will take your tongue as a reminder of this moment. Twilight Eclipse grasped a red bottle tightly in his hand. Chekhov's flask, he whispered before unleashing a spectator into Zrel's waiting minions. The spectator then proceeded to provoke a series of opportunity attacks and accomplish nothing of note. Lazel, on the other hand, killed four cultists in one turn. Perhaps beauty lies not in the eyes of the beholder, but in the action surge of the fighter. Disciple Zrel showed off her brainworm powers before being sliced to ribbons by Jahira. With Zrel defeated, the balance shifted in favour of the heroes, the assault on Moonrise Towers was a flawless victory. 
Sadly, Jahira died. Fortunately, her clothes fit Sir Fuzzlelump well. Jahira lived on in spirit, if not in practice. At the top of the tower, Ketherick Thorm explained that he would happily spend 17 more years building another cult if needs be. Twilight Eclipse was about to be brainwashed with magic, but was saved by Artificiumex Machina, followed immediately by Angelus Ex Machina. Some scholars argue that the angel was added to this fight by jealous historians to downplay Twilight Eclipse's true power. These historians claim that through it all, she offered him protection. Whether they're right or wrong, there were moments when it felt as if all hope was lost. In the party's darkest hour, Minthara, Thorm's once loyal servant, brought the party back from the brink. Before Twilight Eclipse could land the killing blow, Ketherick Thorm declared that he had a second phase, but nobody was allowed to look at it yet because it was a surprise. He summoned a tentacle and disappeared into a cloud of black dust. Ketherick Thorm is dead, announced Twilight Eclipse. We have won. Once Sir Fuzzlelump had explained what teleportation was, Twilight Eclipse let out an exasperated sigh and jumped into a hole. From there, things just got worse. Not only were there nameless, undead horrors like ghouls and zombies, there was also a puzzle that- As the console bursts into life, a mind touches your own. Alien and full of desperate need, but fragment- Thanks for interrupting. There was also a brain-teasing puzzle that looked like a big waste of time. Twilight Eclipse found a sort of evil answering machine powered by brains and a severed head. You would never catch me with my head cut off and without any hair on it, said Twilight Eclipse, unprompted. After a brief team-building exercise, Twilight Eclipse found a room full of mind flayers and normal people floating in tanks. He chose to purge the tanks and was briefly overwhelmed by guilt before remembering that he didn't actually care. At last, the party descended into the heart of Ketherick Thorm's lair. The general was in the middle of an argument with a flamboyant goth and evil dead Barbie. His crept breath sings to my sinews again, 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 again. Eventually, the three villains overcame their differences and formed a cute little tableau to appease an oversized brain. They called the brain the Absolute, and Twilight Eclipse felt the bile rise in his throat as he realized that he had almost sworn loyalty to a giant levitating nerd. Outside, the giant brain commanded an army to start marching, but Twilight Eclipse didn't see that because he wasn't there. He was inside, listening to Ketherick Thorm waffling about how Driders were a menace to society. I will kill you now, and then I will raise you as my servant. Minthara didn't like the sound of that very much. Like a clumsy little fumble thumbs, Ketherick Thorm accidentally fell backwards into an ominous pit. He re-emerged as a skeletal avatar of the God of Death, and Twilight Eclipse wondered whether that scythe had been there the whole time. Sir Fuzzlelump chose this moment to kill a Mind Flayer with an opportunity attack, but sadly nobody was looking. The God of Death was undeniably spooky, but his strategy of standing in one place and not dodging allowed Twilight Eclipse to land a fatal blow. Impossible. Death cannot take me. I am its master. The rats! Together, we have crushed him! Brain and body! As Twilight Eclipse began to wordlessly strip Catherick's corpse, the Dream Guardian appeared. You did well. Really well. This was glaringly obvious and didn't need to be said out loud. The Dream Guardian explained that by combining three magical gems, it was possible to dominate the Elder Brain. If you combine three magical gems, you can do whatever you want, replied Twilight Eclipse. That's how they work. He finished looting Ketherick's corpse and upcycled his armor by dyeing it pink. Minthara spent some time reflecting on her previous mistakes, and Twilight Eclipse suggested that the two of them should seek to take control of the Elder Brain. It is as if you read my mind. Perhaps you did. There is yet one thing about you that troubles me, though. Something I need you to explain. When we killed the tieflings at the Grove, I was not in control of my actions. You do not have that excuse. So I ask you, why? Why kill them? Twilight Eclipse explained that he didn't always know why he did the things he did. He just did them. If you never make a decision, you never make a mistake. Minthara did not seem particularly satisfied with this answer. The final step to taking down a cult is moving on. It was finally time to leave the Shadow Curse lands. It was an unusual place that was hard to warm to, a bit like Milton Keynes. 
As he tried to leave, Twilight Eclipse was ambushed by a group of Githyanki assassins. He had grown used to this sort of thing, and it was becoming increasingly clear that Vlakith was jealous of his power and splendour. Somewhere else in Faerun, the villains were having a disagreement, but Twilight Eclipse didn't know about that because he wasn't there. He was busy climbing a ladder so he could finally catch a glimpse of the city of Baldur's Gate 3. As he lay staring up at the stars, Twilight Eclipse wished he understood how he'd ended up here. One day he'd been minding his business and shaking his authentic locks in the breeze, now he had stumbled into being Faerun's last hope. Gather. The reckoning is upon us! Suddenly and inconveniently, a portal began to discharge Githyanki monks right into the middle of camp. Sir Fuzzalump teleported towards the portal and was quickly pummeled to death. The others fought their way through the invaders and made it safely to the astral plane. Thankfully, Fuzzalump's corpse was brought along with them, and he was quickly revived and put back to work. The Githyanki monks were attempting to break into a giant skull for some reason. Twilight Eclipse trusted his instincts and led his squad onwards towards the epicenter of the conflict. Once they stepped into the skull, it became immediately clear that the Githyanki were the good guys because they were flipping sick, and the Mind Flayer that lay pleading on the floor was the cause of all their problems. Don't let my form deceive you. I am the one that's been protecting you. Twilight Eclipse would not be falling for any Squid Games today. The other Githyanki didn't get the message that Twilight Eclipse was on their side, so he had to deal with them first. While the party were busy with their Xenocide, the Mind Flayer seized the opportunity to do whatever this is. The Mind Flayer asked for an opportunity to explain itself and began telling the most unbelievable story that Twilight Eclipse had ever heard. A significant portion of the tale centered around the creature disguising its true appearance with a flimsy little hood. I am willing to accept that many things are true, said Twilight Eclipse, but I will not believe that such a pathetic facade would not be sniffed out immediately. Were the people you worked with blind? Did you associate exclusively with the criminally stupid? Or were your esteemed colleagues too polite to point out how ridiculous you looked? How long did you expect to live this preposterous lie? For some reason, he felt as though he might be about to cry. The Mind Flayer revealed that his captive was a Githyanki prince, potentially even the rightful ruler of the Githyanki. Twilight Eclipse was not particularly bothered by this and quite fancied himself as a future monarch instead. If you let me, I can evolve you. The Mind Flayer handed Twilight Eclipse a new brainworm, which he immediately slurped up like parasitic spaghetti. A coldness seeps through your veins as the tadpole awakens. It's yearning almost unbearable. Your mind is a veritable feast. This is how it felt when I tried my first Tango Ice Blast in 2021. Twilight Eclipse still didn't trust the Mind Flayer, so he decided it was safer to kill it. Your chest constricts. Your thoughts begin to splinter. You are found. Now you hear me. Now you yield! Obviously that didn't happen. It was a dream. He dreamt it. He continued to poke brainworms behind his eyes, becoming stronger and stronger with each new slippery head tenant. Lazel spent some time educating Twilight Eclipse about Githyanki history, but he couldn't really focus on what she was saying. For some reason, his attention span wasn't quite the same as it used to be. It was a new day and a new sunlit region. Sir Fuzzalump showed the party a new spell he'd been working on. Down the road, the party was annoyingly accosted by an unsupervised child. Um... Excuse me, I can't find my mum. Twilight Eclipse told the little girl to f*** off, and Lazel agreed. Um, I'm... I don't know where to go. Perhaps a flash of my weapon will get the message across. Nice, Lazel. Very nice. In a nearby house, a man was making a scene about some squatters. Twilight Eclipse felt that these stakes sounded very Act 1 and let nature take its course. The flaming fists are supposed to protect this good city but they allow trash and vermin to take our homes and goods. It seemed that an audience member from Question Time had escaped and was now raving in the street. 
Twilight Eclipse imagined that the man's bloviating was intended to distract from the obvious wig that was clinging desperately to his scalp. Down the road, some hunters were complaining because their children had been captured by an evil vampire. My friend from the Hag Swamp. You're a bright light on a dark day. Twilight Eclipse had never seen this man before in his life, but he agreed to help rescue the children anyway. He'd never met a vampire before, and it sounded exciting. He told the monster hunters that saving their children would be his top priority, but then he found out there was a circus in town. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Circus of the Last Days, the finest extra planar circus there is. Ah! <laughs> huh? Twilight Eclipse bore this gatekeeper no ill will, but explained to him that he would tear him apart like for catcher if he didn't step aside immediately. Inside the circus, Twilight Eclipse took part in a game show where he had to answer questions about Lazelle. Two hearts beating a perfect rhythm. But I know the truth. Only one face haunts your dreams each night. Close your eyes, sweetness, and she will come to you. Twilight Eclipse closed his eyes, but when he opened them, the presenter had wandered off and had been replaced by a whining corpse dressed in a lobster costume. Feeling underwhelmed, Twilight Eclipse went to heckle a clown. You, my special assistant. Come on up. You, my friend, are the most special person in the circus in all of Baldur's Gate. Does anyone know why? He didn't appreciate being spoken down to by something as pathetic and desperate as a clown, and was relieved when the whole spectacle turned out to be an ambush. In the ensuing scuffle, Fine Familiar was eaten by a dinosaur, but apart from that, everything was okay. In a nearby basement, the party discovered a sleepy mind flayer, which barely had time to lament its own mortality before becoming proof of it. Twilight Eclipse absorbed its squid-like energy and learned how to transform into a displacer beast. This is a very normal thing to want to do. Everyone was quite accepting of this, except for Lazel. I can see the change in you. Feel the parasite worming its way through you even further. You have invited your own misery. I will not break our alliance for it, but I will not condone it. It felt like the end of a chapter in his life. A road splitting in two. Anyway, that's my story, Twilight Eclipse told the reporter. One road splitting in two, quite poetic if I do say so myself, but I have a feeling I've got one more tale in me. As soon as you're done shapeshifting, I'll tell you the rest. Thank you for watching, and an extra special thank you to my new patrons. Prinsigor, Sandy, Yorick, Daniel, Megan, Flinny, Paul C, Crystal, Vesky, Smith Phillips, Dia, Harvey Adcock, Allegra Silcox, Grace Dunlop, McBussy, and Nickel. Also, everybody who's on the screen now, thanks for your continued support. You guys are legends.